Hey there and welcome. So good to have you with me today. Want to re re um, re underscore that this information is meant for your education only. It's not meant to diagnose or prescribe and you are responsible for any results good or bad you get from using this information. Quick little intro of myself. My name is Judith Cobb. I got into holistic healing over four decades ago. I started playing with holistic healing in 1979 and um, have been a, working with it professionally for over four decades now. It didn't take me long to decide this is where my heart was and this is what I wanted to do with my life. On the screen, you will see two badges. I am a certified level three instructor through the IPA and the badges say that it's 2022 to 2024. That doesn't mean that's how long I've been doing this for. IPA has all of its certified instructors and all of its certified iridologists update their credentials every two years. And when they when we update, we get new badges. So I have been an iridology instructor for mm, 35 years and certified with IPA as, as an instructor under their curriculum for about 10, 12 years, although I've been a constitutional iridologist for much longer than that. I am one of only eight level three instructors in the world, and so I'm pretty excited to have that credential under my belt. Over the many years that I've been in holistic healing, I have uh, worked and written and written courses and taught courses and written books that are now out of print on herbology and biokinesiology and pregnancy and all kinds of things. So we will be talking a little bit today about iridology and about upcoming courses and things like that as well. I'm also a member of two different professional nutrition associations here in Canada and the Alberta Herbalist Association. Really, really happy to be associated with them. They all have very high standards and it's a case of not everybody gets in, just like with IPA, not everybody gets in, right? So important. So again, I started practicing and uh, studying in 79, started holistic practicing and helping clients in 1981. I am the wife of one, the mom of seven, and the grandma of 10. And so we're pretty happy about that as well. I... I started out as a gen sending iridologist in the very beginning because that was all there was. There was nothing else here in Canada. And I um, used it for about 10 years and really started to get frustrated with it, that it wasn't, it wasn't doing what I was told it would do. It was not behaving the way I was told it would behave. And that was when I decided I needed to jump ship and do something different and that was also when I was blessed to begin learning constitutional iridology. Some things I love about constitutional is it helps me to do my assessments much more quickly. And I am much more accurate. When I did Jensenian, I was wrong every time when I would say to my clients, well, your eyes say you have blah, blah, blah. They'd go, no, I don't. And so with the constitutional, I am much, much more accurate. And it's more like a 90%, yeah, I do, right? So that's exciting. Constitutional helps me to uh, build better and faster rapport with my clients. And the better and the faster and the deeper you build rapport, the more likely your clients are going to want to come back to you. If they do not feel rapport, they're not coming back. It's absolutely, that's the truth. That's the truth. And this type of iridology that we're going to be working with today eliminates the need for an intake form. So that means that I sell my client sign an informed consent form, but I don't have them fill out a lengthy questionnaire because the iridology becomes the intake form. And that makes it so easy to use. Um, constitutional iridology helps me integrate everything I know about nutrition and flower essences and aromatherapy and emotional freedom technique and just everything, absolutely everything. So today, I also want you to consider as we are doing as we're doing this introduction, that if you're maybe looking for 
an iridology course that is designed to prepare you for certification as an iridologist, specifically with the International Iridology Practitioners Association. Stay with me on this because we are going to talk a little bit about how that can happen. But I also want you to know a bit about the course that, that we'll be uh, talking about later on because this is so important. The Dynamic Iridology Assessment System is a live online webinar-based course and it's 22 and a quarter hour live webinar classes that are re recorded for play playback on demand. We also have live group mentoring twice each month via webinar. And we have a student and alumni group on the MeWe platform. So instead of Facebook, you know, no one likes to have their data mined and no one likes to be censored, which is why we are on MeWe because they don't mine our data and they don't censor us. And so that's really, we like that because we like to kind of be, you know, a little edgy sometimes with what we're saying. Uh, included in your tuition is a 225 page digital textbook. And I've kept it digital so that when we update the curriculum, periodically IPA does that, they tweak the curriculum. I can update the textbook and because it's digital, I can make it available to all of my students past and present and not charge them for it. Right, it takes me a few hours to do the update, get it all set up, put it where my students can find it and they don't have to keep buying new textbooks. And they're not buying an outdated textbook. Uh, in the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System, you also receive 45 pages of digital study notes. We call those the cheat sheets. They're a quick reference guide to remind you of everything you learned. And I also include the IPA certification men mentoring. Now, not all of my students opt to become certified, and that's perfectly fine, but included in tuition is that gift of 10 months of mentoring to prepare you for certification. Should you decide you want it, most instructors charge extra to mentor for certification. All right, so moving forward. Now that I've got you thinking about what it could look like to, or what it could be involved in certification and what the course might look like, what do we mean by constitutional iridology? Now, constitutional is very different from Jensen. Remember, I practiced Jensen for 10 years and I have tremendous respect for Bernard Jensen. I never did meet him personally, but I've heard so many good things about him. How could someone not adore a professional who dedicated his heart and soul to the profession and who put up with much persecution and kept iridology alive in some form through all that persecution until we could get better information coming from research. So we absolutely adore Bernard Jensen for that. When we're talking about constitutional iridology, it is a system of understanding the differences, the systemic differences, the inborn chemical differences between people who have blue eyes, people who have brown eyes, and people who have hazel or mixed eyes. So let's start looking at some eyes. Do you want to look at some eyes? If you want to look at some eyes with me, give me eyes in the comments box. And when I see that coming through, we'll pop up our first eye slide. If you want to look at eyes, give me eyes in the comments box. Yeah, yeah, I love that, an emoji. Thank you, Susan, that is so good, so good. I'm impressed by people who can do emojis in the chat box, seriously, because I don't know how to do that. Anybody else wanna see some eyes? Or is, is Susan the only one who's awake with us right now? Yeah, okay, oh, Susan's laughing at me, that's funny. Thank you for that, Susan, smarty pants. And Chantelle is there with an eye emoji, good job, thank you. So I want you to think about who you know who's got blue eyes. Let's start with that. Who do you know who has blue eyes? Is it you? Is it a partner? Is it a child? Is it a parent? Is it your best friend? When we are, it's a cousin. Susan's got a cousin. Good job. Thanks for sharing that, Susan. When we are looking at blue eyes, and that is any eye that has some blue in the iris, it does not need to be completely blue, but they often are not completely blue we will always see some fiber in the eye, okay? So this category lymphatic is basically, has a blue base and we have visible fiber. Now you'll notice we've got a little extra color in this eye sitting at, mm, at about, what is that, 42 minutes, 41 minutes. 
And that's not uncommon for a true lymphatic eye. When we are looking at a lymphatic eye, and Susan, I want you to really think about your cousin and see if any of this holds true for your cousin. The common health concerns for people who have lymphatic eyes, their health predispositions, this doesn't mean they have to have these problems right now, but they may have had them in the past and learned how to manage them, or they may be doing lots of things right and have never had these problems, but they are at risk for them. Things like mucous membrane issues, extra mucus production, a little congested, always clearing their throats, elevated acid levels. Think of acid as being mucus, but also think of it as the chemistry that leads to inflammation and challenges with the lymphatic system. So if they're prone to swollen lymph glands and uh, maybe they have challenges with their immune response. So when we are looking at, at someone who's got lymphatic eyes, we want to ask them questions. Iridology is the art of asking questions. It's the art of using the eyes to guide the question. So we're gonna take our client's symptoms and look at the eyes in the context of the symptoms and the context of what the client would like help with. So we might start with a general question like this. Is there a personal or a family history of, because the eyes are genetic, right? They're inherent, of asthma, allergies, arthritis, eczema, psoriasis, kidney issues. Now, when you think of those conditions, asthma, allergies, arthritis, eczema, psoriasis, kidneys, what, what are we looking at for body chemistry? If someone has asthma, if someone has eczema, what do we know about their chemistry? They tend to run a little too hot in the which department? I'm gonna start challenging you here, some pop quizzes. This is where you need to know your anatomy and physiology, right? That's why anatomy and physiology is a prerequisite for the course. When people have eczema and asthma and allergies, what is almost always out of balance for them? Actually, it's always out of balance. They've got too much, too much what? What's another name for mucus? Too much, oh my goodness. Am I stretching you here? Am I making you work hard? See if this answer makes sense for you. They have too much acid. They generate too much acid. If that makes sense, give me a yes in the comments box. Jennifer says acidity. Yes, good job, Jennifer. Yeah, they tend to be too acidic. And if we can get the acid under control, we can help them overcome those issues. Now, some other things we wanna be concerned about because lymphatic people tend to be too acidic. We're not talking stomach acid. We're talking body acid. We're talking blood acid. That hyperacidity in their tissues often leads to thyroid and parathyroid imbalances because their body spends its calcium neutralizing the acid instead of the calcium doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? Let me rephrase that. I misspoke there. I described that very poorly. They tend to have thyroid and parathyroid imbalances, and those imbalances lead to calcium assimilation issues. But those calcium assimilation issues are, are made more difficult because of the hyperacidity. That was a better explanation. So use that one, okay? So we may want to, when we see someone who has lymphatic eyes, we may want to consider asking them, is there a personal or family history of thyroid and parathyroid issues and bone health concerns? Jennifer saying, I just taught on this very topic. Congrats on that, Jennifer. Good job. And so when we see this, we want to be listening to what our client's concerns are. We don't just look at the eye and say, oh, you have blah, 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 blah problems. We want to know what are their concerns. And then we want to look at the eye in light of those concerns, okay? And always, always correlate what you see in the eye to their concerns and to what their end goal is. Here is another lymphatic eye. Notice it's not that beautiful, bright baby blue. Now, lymphatic eyes always have some blue, 
but there are lots of shades of blue. It could be a blue gray. It could be um, a steel gray or a lavender or a violet or a baby blue. Here's what we're looking for. We are always going to see some fibers and there will be always some variation on a theme of blue poking through somewhere in the eye. Again, this same person has, has the potential for more health concerns than just the basic ones of the lymphatic eye, but our starting point is always going to be around the concept of acid levels. Acid levels in the body. How does this client's, how do this client's symptoms correlate to elevated acid? Is their diet also contributing to the elevated acid? If we correct the diet and maybe do a little bit of lifestyle work, can we get that acid into check to where the person no longer has symptoms of being over acid? Okay, so does that make sense? Is this making sense for you? If this is making sense, give me a makes sense in the comments box. I wanna know that this is landing for you because if it's not, we've gotta go over it in a different way to make sure that it fits. I think the internet's a little bit slow today. A little bit slow, we've got some slow connections, but I need to know if this is making sense for you. Jennifer's saying makes sense. Thanks for that, Jennifer, really appreciate that. Now, some of you who've got a different foundation in iridology, you may be saying, but that's not what I already know. And that's exactly why you're here, is to learn a different perspective, okay, to learn a different perspective. All right, so let's do a case. How does that sound? Let's do a case. This is a young woman who came to me. She's in her early 30s. And, um, and when we look at her eyes, she is definitely lymphatic. She's got the blue and we can see fiber. Those are our two indicators. Can we see any blue in the iris, not the sclera, just the iris, and do we see fibers? If we've got those two things, we know she's lymphatic. So we instantly know that she is prone to being a little too acidic. She is also what we call polyglandular, which means she's got lots of, of these closed lacunae, as we call them, attached to the collarette. And she's also anxiety tetanic, which means we have these contraction furrows in her eyes. Now, I know most of you don't know what a lacuna is and you don't know what, um, what contraction furrows are, but that's okay for now. I'm just gonna keep pushing ahead because I want you to see how quick and easy this is. She has a tight collarette, which suggests that she's prone to constipation and poor energy production. But we always ask the client, we never tell the client, so we always ask, how's your energy? How are your bowel movements? Do you know your bowel transit time? Right. This gives us an indication of what questions we need to be asking. Now, this person might have figured out already what she needs to do to keep her bowels healthy. She might have figured out what she needs to do to make sure she gets a clean burn on her energy so that she feels really good. But if not, I can certainly, using what I see in her eyes, ask her about her diet and coach her appropriately based on what I see in her eyes. Now she's all, also polyglandular and that again is inherited and it suggests a predisposition towards hormonal imbalances. So questions that that could trigger depending on what the client is interested in and what her problems are, could trigger questions about thyroid, pancreas, adrenals, reproduction. And so, she was actually concerned about trying to get pregnant. She wanted to get pregnant. And so I always have my fertility clients track their basal body temperature because that gives me a good clue as to whether we are running hypothyroid, right? So it's a super easy screening to do at home. And the fact that she is polyglandic, polyglandular again says, yes, we likely are looking at some kind of hormonal imbalance. The fact that she has a different color sitting in here and that color itself tells us that she is a little bit prone to blood sugar and pancreas imbalances and possibly aller allergies. And we see out here that she may also be prone to lymphatic stagnation, but we don't know that for sure. 
we need to ask if she is or not. So what would you ask to find out if your client likely had lymphatic stagnation? What would be a symptom that a client might have if their lymphatic system isn't flushing well? Give you just a second or two to type it in. So if you know anatomy and physiology, you probably know this. Swelling could be part of it, could be part of it. Mm -hmm. There's something even more common than swelling. Lots of colds or illness. Susan, love that. Yeah, we're looking um, at this stage because she's young and she's relatively healthy. We'd be looking at how is your immune system functioning? Do you tend to get a lot of colds or flus? Brilliant. If she was more advanced, if she was older or had some actual damage uh, or real, real inefficiencies, then we might see the swelling that Jennifer mentioned. So now with this client in particular, she's young, like I said, early 30s. She's very active. She has a really clean diet, like really clean, primarily organic, good fats and oils, good choices for carbohydrates, good proteins. Now, constitutionally, though, her iride suggests that she might be a little bit prone to leaky gut. Now, I don't get to diagnose that. I'm not a medical doctor and I don't have the test to diagnose it, but her diet is good and she has no other symptoms of leaky gut. So she may be keeping her body from developing leaky gut because of her diet and lifestyle. The irides are showing us her inherent potential. When we see little bits of orange sitting in here, and on your computer, it might just look like a dirty yellow. Computers are notorious for um, inaccurate color reproduction. But that little bit of orange suggests blood sugar. Again, is that an issue for her? We ask about energy. We ask about diet. And her diet really, when my clients have diets as good as hers, I tease them and say, oh, can I come live with you? you're eating better than I am. Can I come live with you? Right. And she was one of those. I would live with her in a heartbeat because her diet is so good. But when we look at her eyes, we see a couple of things. We see that when we look in the ovary reaction field, that we've got some funny fibers doing things. We've got this fiber doing this really weird thing right here in an ovary reaction field. We've got it over here in an ovary reaction field as well, where it's just doing weird things. So that suggests mm, it could be an issue. Now we know that those kinds of fibers that are running off across other fibers are inherent. Like this is how she was born. She didn't move that fiber around on her own. And we know that they increase the predisposition towards scarring. And indeed, this young woman had scars in her fallopian tube. She had scar tissues there. And so we're not going to see an absolute because that, that fiber could mean pain. It could mean congestion, but it can also mean an increased predisposition towards scarring. So when I asked her, do you know anything about your ovaries? There was nothing. And I said, what about your fallopian tubes? She said, yeah, there's scar tissue there. Mm, interesting. Okay. So again, we always want to blend what we see when um, what we see in these eyes with the client's goals, and we're going to use this to guide our questions. We're not just going to spew information out there. These eyes have a lot of information, and I could spew all of that out just like I used to when I was a fresh Jensenian iridologist, and most of the information fell on deaf ears because it was overload. So. This client, we put her on an excellent prenatal vitamin. I suspected from the pigmentation I see in her eyes that she possibly has the MTHFR defect. And so I knew I had to use a methylated, whatever I gave her with B vitamins had to have the folate methylated and had to have the B12 methylated. We wanted to make sure we fed her some nerve nutrients because those contraction froze suggest she internalizes her stress. And we also wanted to make sure we did some N-acetylcysteine with her. Been a lot of good research on N-acetylcysteine with hormone balance and things like that for fertility. So she, um, she was on those supplements and we had her on that for a while. Then she found a doctor who could do a recanalization 
of her fallopian tubes. She went and got them, uh, got her fallopian tubes opened up and she did conceive, but then she miscarried very early on, which was very sad. And so when we, when we look at these eyes, do they tell us exactly why she struggles with fertility? They give us several indications, could be hormonal imbalance, could be over acidity, could be ovaries, could be fallopian tubes, right? And so this is where we need to have that conversation with our client to help us narrow it down to understand what's going on. Now, did that make sense? Did you, did it make sense how I pulled that together? If it did give me an oh yeah in the comments box. Susan saying very much, excellent Susan. So good, and Susan, you're new to this. So I'm glad this is making sense for you. Congrats on that. This is what one of my students said. Now, Stephanie is a graduate of my program and she has a master's degree in education. And so that, um, that holds a lot of water. I was this close to becoming a school teacher before I decided that teaching children wasn't gonna be my passion. Stephanie said, when I asked her, why did you decide on my course? Cause there's a lot of courses out there. I'm not gonna kid you, there are a lot. She said, I'd seen enough of instructors online to know that you were the best teacher, the way you organize info, check for understanding and coach your students. Other teachers know their stuff, but you have the heart of a teacher. I wanted to graduate with understanding, not just knowledge. That is so important. I get students who've been certified in other programs other even IFA certified programs coming to my course because they got the the markings they can identify markings but they weren't taught how to put it together and it's not useful if you don't know how to put it together let's do one let's look at the hematogenic eyes we're going to cover the three basic constitutions are hematogenic now anyone here in the group have brown eyes like true dark brown eyes if you do let me know in the chat box the hematogenic eye belongs to someone who's got true brown eyes. Oh, there's Susan. Yay, Susan. We're talking about you now, Susan. And Jennifer as well. Fantastic. Talking about you too, Jennifer. And Chantel. Fantastic. Okay. Well, this is for you. This is for you three. Um, when we see a true brown eye, we call it hematogenic. So when we look at this, we need to remember that with a true brown eye, with the true hematogenic, there might be some gold in there, just like you see on this image, but there will be no visible fibers. We are not going to see any of those threads radiating outward. And we're not going to see any blue or any green in the iris itself. So if we've got no visible fiber and no blue or green, we are looking at a hematogenic eye. And so with these people, as the name implies, one of the areas that we watch for them is their blood. The other area we're going to watch for is their liver. These people are prone to uh, more challenges with blood and liver. We'll often also see things to do with their spleen, stomach and digestion, circulation and heart because that incorporates some blood aspects, varicose veins, pH, these people tend to be more alkaline. Remember, lymphatics tended to be more acidic. Our hematogenics tend to be more alkaline. So we need to help them develop a little more acid so they can assimilate their minerals properly. Um, they also need, um, need a little extra calcium. And I'm not fond of just throwing calcium tablets at these people. I'd rather do it through herbs and through foods. But again, because they don't have enough acid, they don't assimilate their minerals. So we need both the acid and the minerals. The minerals are critical for the endocrine system, again, that hormone system, and for metabolism. So we always want to make sure that the, the acid is balanced here, that they've got enough, and that they're getting enough minerals. Susan says, ugh, yes, sounds like she's got some of these concerns. So again, beautiful brown hematogenic eye, no visible fibers, and what we see in here doesn't count. This is a separation, this is a lacuna, and that means it's a separation in the fibers on the top layer of the eye, and what we're seeing beneath here is um, fibers that are down a layer. 
but you'll notice in the rest of the iris, there is enough pigment sitting on the surface of the eye that it is masking all of the fibers in that top layer. When we see all of these other lacunae in here, that of course gives us a whole new depth of information. So who wants us to do a, a hematogenic case study? If you do, let me know. You wanna do a hematogenic case study? Gonna give you a minute to let me know that. Those of you who have brown eyes, is that a particular interest for you? Yeah, yeah, Chantel's giving me a beautiful thumbs up. Thank you, Chantel. Here we have the eyes of a client who was in her mid fifties. Now, apparently, and I felt badly that I didn't remember it, but about 20 years before she came in and we did these photos, I had helped her, seen her for two appointments and completely fixed, helped her fix a sinus problem. And she never needed to come back. She felt great. And now here she was in her 50s having some other problems. So she thought, oh, Judith could wave her magic wand and could fix me. Well, maybe not quite, but at any rate. So she was coming in because she had hot flashes and she did not want to have hot flashes. I don't think there's very many women that enjoy hot flashes. And she also had a history of depression, although she had worked through that. She's a psychologist by training. And so she's got a lot of those mental health tools at her disposal. She is, um, has a very active practice with psychology and she is also very physically active on a daily basis. And physical activity is a key thing for women who are going through menopause. Um, being physically active every day is one of the best things that menopausal women can do to reduce symptoms. So that was very cool. Now, she also has a very clean diet and she was using some really good quality supplements as well that were very appropriate for her age and stage and for, for what she was taking them for. She also had one cup of Turkish coffee per day. Now, I have no idea what Turkish coffee is. I think it's really strong and I think you use little tiny cups, but I could be totally wrong. So that was her story. As we look at her eyes, she also has contraction furrows. Notice she has lines that radiate out. These are called radial furrows. When we put contraction furrows together with radial furrows, those of you who've got Jensen behind you, this is not an indication of parasites, right? These lines don't go away when you put them on a parasite cleanse. This, these radial furrows and these contraction furrows are an indication that she, she burns through her nerve nutrients very, very quickly. She also has this dark brown pigment right here, which again makes me wonder, could she have the MTHFR defect? That's one of the possible indicators. You'll notice that she's got some heavy clouding over the edge of her iris. This suggests that liver enzymes are out of balance and have been out of balance for some time and that those liver enzymes are messing with how she processes her carbohydrates. So it could mess with her lipid panel, her cholesterol readings, her triglycerides, her blood sugar balance. When we see blood vessels in the sclera, this gives us specific information about where the circulation is getting congested in specific organs. Okay, so let's go back to her prime concern. Her prime concern was that she wanted to get rid of the hot flashes. Her diet was good. She consumed one little cup of Turkish coffee a day. She has daily physical activity and she takes good quality supplements. So as we were talking about her hot flashes, one thing I know for sure is that caffeine always makes hot flashes worse. So I asked her, would she be willing to do an experiment to give up the coffee for 10 days to see if it affected her hot flashes? And she was willing to do that. So she went off, did that homework. The next time she came in, I asked her, how did that go? And she said, noticeable difference. When she took away the coffee, hot flashes were barely even warm waves. They were very manageable. And then she said, but it's the only thing I do that's not good for me. And I really enjoy it. 
don't you have any other solutions, anything else that could help me stop these hot flashes? And I had to say no. I have many herbs that can be helpful here from many different angles, but I don't have anything that can fight against the abuse that coffee delivers on the body, the way it depletes B vitamins, the way it toughens the stomach lining, messes with the adrenal glands, messes with the thyroid, messes with bone density, messes with the liver. That's most of what it messes with. And I just don't have a herb that will do all that. In order to create a program that would counter all of that, it would be a bucket load of supplements every day to compensate for the one little cup of Turkish coffee. So I had to suggest the best I could offer her would be a, an excellent quality B complex that was methylated. And um, really there was nothing else I could offer her because I knew she wasn't willing to take as many supplements as it would require. And so she'd already tried hormone replacement therapy and had no luck with that. It was just making matters worse. And so um, I had to send her out with love and just let her know that, you know, if you change your mind at any point in time, please, please give it another go. And if it's not quite enough to do the job, come back because then I have a whole palette of different things that we can work with to get rid of all of the hot flashes. So I asked another one of my students, why do you choose my course? Now, Mike is a naturopath in Arizona. Now, naturopaths are considered to be first um, primary caregivers. They're on the same par as medical doctors in Arizona. So this is a really good recommendation, right? And he said what drew him to the class was the interactive online platform with an experienced teacher and practitioner. You said the fundamentals of iridology can be learned in this format, and that's what was delivered, plus a lot more on how to integrate it directly into current practice. I'm very happy with the training, so thank you. Now that uh, integrate in directly into current practice, I've had students come to me, as I said, who've studied elsewhere, and I'm not knocking other teachers. I don't want you to hear me hear that I'm knocking them, but the students didn't learn. They were not taught how to integrate iridology with what they already do with their nutrition, their herbology, their flower essences, their aromatherapy, the uh, physical therapy. I've had a physical therapist. I've had all kinds of health professionals come through the program. And so when these students are coming to me, they're saying, I went to my other teacher and asked, how do I use this now that I know these pieces? And the teachers have said, oh, you'll figure it out on your own. And my feeling is no. You probably need a little help to get started. You need to see different ways of incorporating it. You need to practice that incorporation while you're learning it to get everything to stick. And then when you finish the program, you'll be able to take that and morph it to be exactly what you need it to be. But you'll have a solid start and you're not going to feel like you're floundering. So that's really important to me that my students feel confident using this not just that they can pass a test, but that they feel confident using this and using it with the other modalities they already have. Let's look at our third kind. Any of you have eyes that aren't brown, but they're also not blue? Kind of somewhere in between it feels like, or do you know anybody who's got eyes like this? If you do, give me, um, give me the word hazel in the chat box. Do you know anyone who you look at their eyes and you think, mm, they're not blue, mm, they're really not brown, they're kind of halfway in between. Anybody? No one? If you do, keep typing and hit send. We call this the biliary eye. Now, sometimes when we are just looking at people face to face and we see an eye like this, we think, they have brown eyes. Chantel's dad is like this fantastic Chantel. And when we see eyes like this up close, we see fibers. Okay, and Susan is saying, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm thinking I may be more of this than true brown. Hey, good job, Susan. That is fantastic. If you're seeing any kind of fiber in there, but you're not seeing any blue, 
yes fiber, no blue, that puts you into this biliary category. And so when we see this, those of you who've got Jensen training under your belt, you may have been taught that these people need to be cleansed, that their eyes are full of toxins. And if they do enough cleansing, their eyes are going to turn blue. That is not true. Their eyes are not going to turn blue. I cannot tell you how many people I put through cleansing paces, some pretty intense cleanses, had eyes like this, didn't see a color change. Not in six weeks, not in eight weeks, not in three months, did not see a color change. The pigment you see is genetic. And the areas where we don't see fiber have more pigment, more dense pigment. The areas where we do see fiber have less pigment. So again, we'll often see gold in here. We'll often see that there is a darker ring at the center and there'll be lighter, a little bit lighter areas radiating out from there. So the questions we want to ask here again are, is there a personal or family history of digestive concerns or liver or gallbladder or pancreas concerns? Now, in truth, many of your clients won't even know what you mean. Now, do you have any liver concerns? Well, the doctor hasn't said I have cirrhosis. I must be okay. Mm, liver does over 500 different jobs. Cirrhosis affects many of them, but it's not the only thing that can go wrong. So we need to be able to break it down and say to a person like this, we listen to their symptoms. Oh, Susan, I love that. Are you easily angry? That is one of the best symptoms of a liver that's out of balance. Yeah. Anger, bitterness, resentment. Gold star, Susan. Good job. Absolutely. You're looking for things like when you eat fatty foods, does it make you nauseous? Do you have greasy bowel movements? Have you ever been told you're anemic? How's your blood sugar balance? Because liver plays strongly into working with the pancreas on blood sugar balance. How's your cholesterol? How are your triglycerides? How's your immune system? Did you know that 10% of your liver's mass is dedicated to immune response? Right? So we ask, ask the most appropriate questions from a list like that, that your client would have answers to. But to say, do you have a liver issue? They probably don't know. So put it in language they understand. And as you do that, so if this client came in with digestive concerns, you're going to use those questions to narrow it down. What do they mean by digestive concerns? Are they talking they burp a lot? Do they have heartburn? Do they get bloated? Uh, do they get a low abdominal bloat and pass a lot of gas? Um, you know, you, you need to get picky? Are there foods they've learned to avoid because it, those foods cause problems for them? So again, Billy, that gives you a, a hint. The Billy, bilious, coming from the liver, right? That gives you a hint that liver is a key player here. So here's another example of a beautiful biliary eye. Notice the uneven pigmentation. We've got lots of golds. We've got some browns. We've got that darker center area. And we can see fibers poking through here. We see some fibers where the pigment's not as dense. So we know that this is a really good example of a biliary eye. So Susan, what do you think? Should we maybe do a case study here since you're our biliary candidate today? Do you want us to do a case study here? Yes, please. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. So this is a biliary eye. Notice how these eyes look very dark. That is photographic. That is photographic. But also notice if you look very, very closely, you can see areas where there's little bits of fiber poking through. And that's all we need. No blue and yes fibers. Now this, these are the eyes of a two-year-old. Actually, this is the niece to the blue-eyed case study we did. And um, getting really good photos, eye photos of a two-year-old can be challenging. So we felt we did very, very well to get these as clear as they are. Now, again, she's, her family, um, she is third generation client for me. I took care of her mom and her aunt, of course, but I took care of their mother as well when their mother was having the daughters who had this little girl. 
the daughter had this little girl. So we've got three generations here. If you want to talk about client retention, right? Very, very fun. And so this family is just known for eating really, really well. Organic from scratch, virtually nothing from a package. That pastas, if they're doing pastas, they make their own from scratch. I mean, just amazingly good quality stuff. So this little girl, mom was bringing her in because um, even though the diet is really good and very loving home, very compassionate parenting here, this little girl was starting to have meltdowns. And to the point where if she started to have a meltdown, she would scream for six or seven or eight hours and would not stop. She would just get so wound up that you just couldn't find an off button for her. You couldn't distract her. You couldn't talk her out of it. You couldn't scare her out of it. You couldn't love her out of it. Couldn't, she would just go. And her mother was just beside herself. This mother is a good mom, a really good mom. And I was like, what are we doing wrong? Now, this little girl had also started to experience colds. She doesn't go to daycare, but she was starting to get sick a lot. Like, how was she getting exposed to colds? Well, you don't catch a cold, you invite a cold. If your chemistry is off, there's viruses and bacteria in the air all around us. You don't have to have a close exposure. You're going to get it, right? And so when we look at these eyes, we've got excellent fiber structure. This little girl is also has those contraction furrows, so she internalizes her stress. That tells us a lot right there. Two-year-olds have stress. It's different from what we have as adults, but they lose their favorite stuffed animal. They've got stress, right? She has slight, slight bit of netting on the sclera right next to the iris, and she's got a somewhat constricted collarette. She also has the brown that radiates out like spokes on a wheel. That gives us indications about liver and some of the liver functions. And, and so we've got all of these things that are confirming that she, um, she needs a little bit of liver support genetically. It's nothing like mom hasn't been feeding her toxic food. She just has a higher demand for these things. So when we talked about diet, this little girl, mom was doing a really great job, except that this little girl really loves fruit. We don't live in a fruit belt. Like we're starting to get chilly here. Uh, you know, by January, we'll be minus 40 for at least three weeks, right? We are not a fruit belt here. But this little girl was asking for fruit constantly. So, you know, every Every snack, every meal had fresh fruit in it. Well, for eyes like this, fresh fruit, too much fresh fruit is the equivalent of feeding them sugar, straight sugar, right? So we got the mom to swap that out, to do some proteins for snacks, to do complex carbs for snacks, to make sure there was more good fat in there. And um, we also got the mom to give this little girl some good methylated bees because there's indications here that she needed that as well. And I think we maybe used rose hips. I like rose hips as a kind of a multivitamin for children. So we used some rose hips and suggested that this little girl is the kind of girl who really needs physical activity. And so encouraged, um, encouraged them to get her into some tumbling, some dancing, um, also a lot of create creativity happening with these eyes. These eyes say you want to be creative. And so suggested, um, you know, get her into some toddler painting classes, some toddler drawing classes, get lots of different toys that can be sorted and organized as well, because those are some things that this little girl probably would love. And as we, as she did that, as she did that, you know, I got a phone call about two or three weeks later saying, Thank you for giving me my little girl back. She's sweet. We can reason with her. Now, when she gets upset, we can work it through with her. We can teach her strategies for coping now because she's more balanced. She's doing so much better. And it was just exciting to see. We, I wouldn't have known to say, cut the fruit almost out, focus on the other foods if I hadn't seen all kinds of things in her eyes that pointed us in that direction. 
So Susan, I don't know how much of that applies to you, but there you go. There's your gift for today. There might be something in there that's a nugget. This is one of my graduates, Valentina Rogak. She is, she does not speak English as a first language. Her English is really quite good, but it is not her first language. She's Central European. She had already certified as an iridologist under another teacher in another, um, you know, in another organization. And we were just a few weeks into her studies with me when she sent me this message. Dear Judith, I just wanted to tell you that your lectures are awesome. I've already learned so much new. Your explanation is so simple. I finally understand things that I didn't understand with my previous study. Thanks for being the best teacher ever. When she certified the first time, she certified with a teacher in her own language. And here she was doing better in an English course. So that was pretty exciting to me. Uh, one of the things that Valentina used was the classes for her were going to be at like 2 a.m. her time. She's got a family. That's not a reasonable time to get up and take a class. But since every class session is recorded and students, my, each student in that cohort has access to the recordings, she actually did the course by watching those recordings and then one of our mentoring sessions is early enough in my day that it's evening her time. And she also had our MeWe group. And if she had a question, she would bring it to the early office hours or post it in MeWe so that we could answer her and make sure that she felt confident and comfortable with what she had learned. And just such high compliments from her that I just truly, truly appreciated that. But it just proves that not every, that all iridology certification programs are not created equally, right? Some of them have the content, but not the integration. So just want to lob this out there that the next course start date, and I want you to think of if there's any questions about what we've talked about today, pop those into the chat box. Our next course start date for dynamic iridology is November 1st. So that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock Mountain, 7.15 Mountain Daylight Time. Now, if you're in the U.S. and you're on Daylight Time now, you know that in the first week of November, we're going to switch off. So you just need to know whether you're on it or not and how that's going to affect you. Registration closes on October 30th. The only way to register is by having a conversation with me, a private Zoom meeting with me, because I need to chat with you. I need to make sure that this course is right for you. I don't want your money if this course is not gonna be a good fit. So as we chat together, I wanna make sure you've got a college level anatomy and physiology course under your belt. I wanna make sure that this feels really good for both of us, that our energies mesh well, so that we can, um, and that your energy will mesh well with the other students. There will be up to 10 students in your cohort. And we just want to make sure it feels good. Susan says, does your course cover solutions for what you see, like rose hips for kids, multi, et cetera? We do. We integrate some of that. We don't integrate. It's not a herb course and it's not a nutrition course, but we integrate enough herbology and enough nutrition for you to then draw on what you already know. And as we practice together in class, this is the integration part. We all, at the end of every class, we put some eyes up and I pop quiz you to find out, make sure that what we've been talking about lands. And when we get to where we're talking about solutions, you know, I will ask, uh, Susan, with your herbal background, I'm pretending you've got that. I don't know if you do or not. With your herbal background and with what you've seen this time, what we've talked about for markings and history, what would be one herbal remedy, one herbal approach you would suggest for this person. So I get you starting to dig into your training, your existing previous training, to start integrating that with what we are learning in class, right? And so I've had physiotherapists, like I said, in the class, and I'll ask them with what we've talked about, what would you do? And they'll talk about the kinds of manipulations or the kinds of exercises they would give. I've had aromatherapists, what would you do? I know herbalists, nutrition coaches, uh, acupuncturists, all kinds of people. And they're all giving answers from their own backgrounds, which means that all of my students are also learning from each other at the very same time. How does that sound? Does that sound like fun? 
So if you want to do this, if you're thinking, this sounds like a really good thing, I want to know more, okay, then you want to use this link that I just popped into the chat box. This is the opportunity to schedule a time to chat with me on Zoom, a private Zoom meeting, to talk about the course. I can give you a tour of the what the class, your, your online classroom looks like. Uh, we can talk about your credentials, what your goals are, talk about is this a good fit for you. If it is a good fit, I will give you the enrollment link and will invite you to enroll. If it's not a good fit, I will make other suggestions. You know, it might be that I can see very clearly you don't have six hours a week, two hours for the class and four hours for study and things like that, but you don't have that kind of time. So I might suggest this isn't the right time. Let's touch base in six months or in four months and see how you're doing then. Or maybe you don't have the anatomy and physiology. Then I'll give you a link to the A&P course that I like my students to have if they need an extra A&P credential. Um, but I'm always wanting to make sure that it is the very best fit so that you will be happy, so that I will be happy. My happiness is important too, right? But I want you to be happy. I want you to feel comfortable. I want you to love what you're learning. And I want you to love the community that you're coming into as well. So I encourage you, um, if, if enrolling in a program that is the only live, online, fully mentored iridology program, that is designed for holistic health professionals or for health professionals have had a lot of registered nurses and massage therapists come through as well. But it's for health professionals and people who are working to become health professionals. If that's what you want so that you can do your iris analysis work in your paid client sessions, you're not going to write lengthy reports for your clients. You're going to do the assessment when you're with them. As far as it needs to be done, you're going to create your program while you are with them to give them the next step or two or three little steps that they should be working on to move in the right direction. If you want to create client compliance and long-term retention, I've got clients who've been with me for 40 years now. And like we looked at third generation clients, um, then I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and use that link. And let's see if this is a good fit. So Jennifer, I don't know um, if your holistic nutrition counselor program is sufficient for a &P. The International Iridology Practitioners Association will require you showing them a transcript that shows a separate a &P course with a grade over 80%. So if your, your training sort of wove the a and P into it, that's not going to be sufficient. You will need a separate a and P course. And so um, again, that would be something we could discuss further in a call. And I can certainly provide you with the anatomy and physiology link if, if it's the right thing to do for you, right? So I, when, whenever there's only uh, a couple of schools that I know they have the anatomy and physiology and it's absolutely accepted. I know there are many more schools that IPA does accept, but I don't know all of them. And so sometimes what I do is I have my students, if they've got a transcript and it shows the courses they took, I'll have them submit that to IPA even before they enroll in my program. Have IPA approve it. Yes, this will, would count then we get you enrolled in my program. And if it doesn't, if it's not good enough, then I give you the A and P link. I don't want you getting to the end of an iridology program and realizing that you can't complete certification because the A and P you have is not sufficient. How heartbreaking would that be? I'd rather deal with that up front. Again, I don't want your money if this is not a good fit. So Again, if you are a holistic health professional or you're studying to become that and you've got the anatomy and physiology under your belt, I know the outline uh, from IPA says it has to be an a and course of at least 60 study hours. So if it would take you 60 hours to complete just the anatomy and physiology portion, then it will likely be approved. Um, but if you wanna talk about that, let's schedule a call. Use that link I posted a few minutes ago and let's get in there and have a chat. See if this is a good fit. And if it is, is the November 1st start date a good time? And let's get you rolling. 
any any other questions or comments here? I hope you've learned something about the three foundational constitutions. For those of you who have the Jensen training, those three constitutions can be a little mind blowing. I remember when I first learned the three constitutions and compared them to my Jensen training, I was, it took me a moment. It took me a moment to grab it and go, okay, I can do this, right? So if that's where you're at, I totally understand. Uh, Susan is asking, we don't have six hours a week for this involved of a course. Do you have other trainings to start with? So Susan, uh, not trainings that will take you anywhere. Certainly I do a mini class like this just about every week on many different topics. So that would be a place to do it. I do have a little five mini class course that's only $37. That is also a possibility for you to kind of get your feet wet. It covers a lot of what we covered today, plus a tiny bit more. Um, actually does it in more depth because each of the eye types is a separate mini lesson. Um, but ideally, you know, it's the six hours a week. It's the two and a quarter hours for the class itself. And then a couple of other hours spread throughout the week for study and a couple of other hours spread throughout the week to practice, to be looking in people's eyes. And so that's where we go with that, that, uh, that you really want to have the time to study and practice to make sure this really sinks deeply and that you understand it super well. Anything else I can help you with today? That was fun. I want to thank those of you who commented and got involved. I know that feels a little vulnerable when you don't know me very much yet, but to thank you for being vulnerable and for taking that risk. And I've enjoyed having you with me and I look forward to having calls with you in the very near future. Have a good week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.